Hi guys, uh, bringing you another in the series called Conflicted. And basically I'm taking you guys through the steps of my career where I was working out some conflicts in, in my own education, development, application, and profession. As a physical therapist and as a strength coach, I'm sitting here looking at movement and exercise from a perspective in, in early rehabilitation where people can barely move all the way to high-end performance. And we get stuck in these models and these protocols that we're trained to do and it becomes our comfort zone. And we wind up defending these concepts that maybe we didn't even think about. So we're, we're all about the workout, whether it's in rehab or training or our own personal effort, but do we ever really work out the whole program, how we're doing it, how we talk? And I was amazed when I heard a story about John Wooden, one of the most accomplished uh, basketball coaches of all time, actually in the Hall of Fame, both as a player and an athlete. And at UCLA, John Wooden would spend more time designing a basketball practice session than the session would actually take. That means every minute was planned out, every transition was purposeful. And the funny thing is, in those days, I don't think John Wooden had a strength conditioning coach. He basically had you move quickly from skill drill to skill drill in the presence of moderate fatigue, doing game-like situations, both working on skill and conditioning together. And what did I just say? It took more of an investment of time putting that together than it did to let it play out. But it played out really well, statistically speaking, in John Wooden and all of his team's favor. So thinking a little bit more about what we do before we do it is going to distinguish some of us and leave others behind. So we use this term functionally. and and. Uh, I, I want to go deep into why we use that term, how we use that term, and how does it matter? Well, when you're a pro and you use a term, it's different than when you're a consumer or enthusiast and use a term. So if we go to the dictionary and start looking at definitions and ways of describing function, it's used to contribute to the development and maintenance of a larger whole. It's got to be holistic and it's got to be almost global. We talked about that already. Uh, it's designed to, or developed chiefly to be useful. And it's designed to be practical rather than attractive. Oops. How many times do we pick or do an exercise because it looks badass or attractive, but we don't really have anything other than being tired at the end of it to show that we did anything? Uh, any, any coach can make you tired, but what are we going to exchange for your effort? Are we going to exchange a better balance, mobility, stability, power, energy storing? What are we going to exchange for that and what are we willing to measure? You know, it's funny. Uh, we've always had an appreciation of speed, but as professionals, if we call ourselves a speed coach, you own a stopwatch, an objective measure that protects you from your own BS and all the people you're working with. So if a speed coach should have a timing device and we're coaching or training or teaching function, what is our device? Don't think we have one or at least we didn't when I started asking these questions early in my career. Now, when we want to contribute, we want an exercise or an activity contribute to the whole of movement, what are we actually saying? We want to see something transferable. If you do something in the gym, but it's not simply to go there and meet people or move around, it's actually so you can take it out to the hiking trail or the slalom ski course or the tennis court, then you need that effort expenditure in the gym to be transferable. It needs to be measurable somewhere else other than the sets and reps that you did. And I think we all assume transferability from exercise to the activities we love. But if you ain't measuring it, you can't take credit if it happens. All right, so measurement is important and also strategic. It's got to be practical, meaning function needs to meet you where you are. If function is a sliding scale, some people are more functional than others, that means we would consume a different diet of activity in that restoration endeavor to get us back to where we need to be. So exercise needs legitimacy and legitimacy comes from transferability. What did the exercise get me other than the activity itself? Because some people use their gym membership and their exercise as their only activity. The rest of their life is pretty much sedentary.
and that's okay, that's just fine. But for those of us who have another purpose for that exercise, the legitimacy of the expenditure of time comes through in the transferability to the activities we want to do. And what we realized a long time ago is if your exercise program is robbing you of balance, flexibility, movement awareness, symmetry, and function, then you may not be able to transfer nearly as much of that effort in the gym over to that thing that you really love to do. So if we look at a 10-year history of ER visits induced by exercise, whether it had equipment involved or it's just body weight, we're on a trend of people getting hurt trying to become better. And I just want you to let that sink in. ER visits are not just for people in hard hats or people doing work with chainsaws and stuff. There are people showing up to the ER in their workout clothes not having any idea that what they were doing had the risk of running a chainsaw or riding a dirt bike, and yet they're in the ER sitting right next to those people. Something's wrong, guys. And, and, and since this is our profession, our wheelhouse, from rehabilitation all the way to performance enhancement, that's on our watch. That has happened. And we can always blame it on the other professional or the way the individual consumes. But had we made the path clearer, had we made the instructions better, and had we made the point of entry to exercise more scale to your current abilities, we may not see exercise actually being a risk factor. It's supposed to be a risk factor in the other direction. The more you're active, the more we're supposed to see your risk go down and your health go up. But these are people in the ER, and the one thing I can tell you about their effort and exercise today, it didn't make them healthier because they wound up in the ER. So let's ask ourselves this question. Are people showing up to the ER after they've exercised because they didn't have enough exercise information? Or they didn't have a point of entry that let them know that their abilities may be far better are far lower than they expect. See, if you enter exercise and you're below your abilities, you won't get a change to reinforce the effort expenditure. You won't have anything to transfer because you won't have stressed the system to become better. If you enter above where you need to be, you're gonna consume a level of stress that will probably cause you to compensate, smoke out early, have bad form, and end up hurting yourself in that endeavor. So that point of entry has always been a, a point of contention for me because if we go on the internet right now, you will still find way more videos showing people how to exercise than how to know which exercise is right for them. Guys, that's been a niche for us the whole time. The point of entry to consuming exercise and activity deserves a functional scale. And when I entered both the strength conditioning profession and the rehabilita rehabilitation profession, we're coaching speed without a stopwatch. We're trying to create function without a baseline. And I don't think you'd respect an eye doctor that didn't have an eye chart or a cardiologist that didn't at least start with a blood pressure cuff and finding out where are you today and what are we gonna do about it. Legitimacy equals a global transferability. This activity enhanced that activity, a measurable and objective scale because you're a professional and you're charging people for what you do. You should be able to measure the front end, measure the back end, and take credit for good changes and be responsible when things don't change. And that's what I'm talking about when I say the word strategic. We're not simply throwing exercises at people to entertain them or distract them from the activity that they should be expending. We're putting them on a path to rediscover some of those movement resources like breathing and mobility and stability that underpin almost everything we do in rehabilitation and that's what we end up working on on the high-end people anyway. That's, that's where the, the, the functional movement systems has both distinguished itself in, in athletics and at the tip of the spear in the military but all the way down to a rehab model as well. Simply measuring things that people used to assume and we don't do that anymore so guys I did uh, two talks before this and if you followed me through those you're arriving right here at something I owe you I owe you a hands-on experience so if you stick with it we're gonna actually do some exercise hands-on stuff and you can either participate as the client or you can find somebody with the problems we're talking about coach them through the corrective experience and start polishing your ability to do that 
How do I take what I learned about their screen and use a drill or a path to elevate their awareness and demonstrate a measurable? And that's the one thing I haven't talked about yet. I talked about local and global measurements of movement in my Conflict in One talk. I talked about response and adaptation and the ways we allocate that strategy in Conflicted Two. And now I'm sitting here saying, if you do everything I said and still don't measure your work, you're not gonna get credit for it and you're not gonna know when you're right to reinforce, you're not gonna know when you're wrong to recalibrate. So, legitimacy equals measurable and we've gotta measure something. So when we say functional exercise, we're talking about a global representation of positive change. And there were a lot of us out there engaged in and talking about functional exercise before we had a functional scale. And I honestly think it was in response to the isolation strategies that we have to do in rehabilitation and that were becoming popular in the 70s and 80s and early 90s in bodybuilding. We got, we got high-end PTs and chiros isolating the rotator cuff and working in isolation. We've got bodybuilders who are the action figures of our time getting puffed up and they got there through isolation. And so there's nothing wrong with taking that local dive on a body part, but there's also something good about backing out and becoming global. Well, it didn't take us long to realize you can't build an athlete or a dancer or a fighter in the weight room. Although the weight room can enhance these activities, these activities need to be supported by the weight room, not eclipsed by the weight room agenda when you're using exercise to transfer to something else. So we're actually using the word functional exercise 10 years before anybody thought of having a functional scale with which to grade your entry point, your exit point, and what is normal. Now, I'm talking specifically about the work of Vern Gambetta and Gary Gray. When I was coming through PT school, both of these guys were sort of in the literature and in on the lecture circuit talking, calling us back toward function. Vern was giving us some simple, practical, body-relevant, movement pattern-based exercises saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because the bench press got better doesn't mean the shoulders are functioning optimally. I'm glad he said that. Gary Gray showing us the same thing in physical therapy with single leg stance assessments, star excursion test, which evolved all the way into something we use every day, the Y balance test. So these guys were actually calling us back to function and it is no it is no criticism on my part that they were so busy calling about function that they had an internal scale that they didn't hand out to us that we could reproduce that. You don't hold the eye chart inside. If there is a reasonable scale measurement for vision, you basically publish it, you vet it, you throw it out there, and then you let basically people see if they can use that tool effectively. These guys gave us a bunch of good functional perspectives and ideas, and I'm probably standing on their shoulders to get to the movement screen anyway, because that's what we needed to add to that idea, that concept, that philosophy they were trying to bring us back to. So if all you have is functional exercise and don't have a functional scale, then what you wind up is they can do it, meaning the exercises, because I came up, we could easily come up with exercises we think were functional. Show me a functional exercise for climbing a ladder. Show me a functional exercise for um, jumping, hopping, and skipping, and we'll, we'll assemble those things. If they can do it, let's call them functional. If they can't do it, let's call them dysfunctional. And if they can't do it, we just practice, but now you just tied yourself in a knot because you're practicing the test. So we basically need to think of a way to improve your vision without memorizing the eye chart. Because the minute you memorize line six on the eye chart, you're not reading it anymore and I can't get a valid gauge of what you can see and can't see. And if we memorize movements, they will never be authentic. And if we practice the test, we may score differently than we should to help us most. Remember, a test gets you a failure. 
but life gives you a loss. So we test you so you won't lose. But a lot of people avoid testing thinking the F means loss. It doesn't. It means wake up and pay attention. You're not doing what you're supposed to do here and we can measure it. Um, so I honestly think having the term functional exercise, functional rehabilitation, functional training, and not having a functional screen, a functional test, a functional assessment is a reflection on our need to try to change things before we fully measure things and measure the effectiveness of the things we're doing. Because once you have that functional scale, even if your favorite exercises are your favorite exercises, if they don't change function, you can't call them functional. You just call them exercise because we can't transfer anything that they're doing. Now, this is one of my mentors from University of Miami, Dr. Mike Voigt, and I think we wound up in New Orleans one day, and that's a picture of us. But our collaboration and our common sense of humor and camaraderie allowed us to sort of uh, steel sharpen steel. And from our collaboration, we were on the lecture circuit teaching functional exercise, but I was ruminating and Mike was ruminating about this baseline. We need a scale because we're talking functional exercise to 55 people in the seats. Every seat has a different definition of what function is. This person is working predominantly with a geriatric population. This person's sports medicine. This person from the Olympic Training Center. This guy's in Major League Baseball. This guy's a high school uh, coach. So everybody is seeing function through the sliver of the fence that they're looking through and not at this global perspective of function from the cradle to the grave. There are functional milestones babies got to cover to be considered normal. But once they're toddlers, we don't use functional milestones anymore, but we could because a lot of people lose their squat for no reason whatsoever. So we started putting out papers on both, let's look at things functionally, let's see what we can change, but the whole time, I'm feeling a little hypocritical because we still don't have a functional scale we can agree on. I've got my ideas, he's got his ideas, we got our ideas, but there's no eye chart, there's no blood pressure cuff, there's no consensus on what function is, yet a second is a second and an inch is, is an inch and hypertension is hypertension and poor vision is poor vision. So we don't really have a good definition for the thing we're trying to change. That means we'll always change it to our satisfaction because we always do good work, right? That's a self-serving confirmation bias loop that you'll never get out of. And so when we introduced the functional scale, you'd be surprised how many people who were fans of functional exercise didn't like it because either it didn't look like what their opinion of function was or it basically proved that maybe your exercises aren't changing things on the baseline. So you got two choices, drop your exercises or make your own baseline. And we were sitting right at that crossroads. As young physical therapists, athletic trainers, strength coaches, we came up with a functional screen and many of our exercises that we had trained and paid time and effort and money to learn didn't change function. It didn't mean they weren't good exercises, but they may have been performance exercises that we were shoving into a functional box. They may have been rehabilitation exercises that were far too easy to cause a change over here. So we needed the scale. And when we came up with the movement screen and polished that thing and beat on that thing and watched how it worked, we found it likes some exercises and not others. And so we use the functional screen to help us define what was changing function without practicing the test. That's a clean way to look at things, guys. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an engineer and I'm not a researcher, but I know how to get to the practical bottleneck of a problem. And we started publishing on that. And we were, I think, not on the forefront of functional exercise, but on the forefront of pulling that functional exercise more into to science and less into a touchy-feely guru art form and then measuring it to add legitimacy to both rehabilitation and strength conditioning. Remember, we got more ER visits because of exercise, not less. And we don't have a functional baseline, my first conflict. Hippocrates, the same uh, Greek physician that said, let's first do no harm is basically saying to us, let's be aware. Let your food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be thy food. And couldn't we say the same thing about function or activity? Don't jam exercise in there. See, exercise is a supplement. 
All right? Just like vitamin C is a supplement that we will add to our food in the presence of deficiency, but I don't like just putting exercise as the only way you can be active. Some people actually score better on the movement screen that don't have an exercise life or a gym membership, but they work very hard and they use their body in functional ways every day and they measure just fine on function. They may not do well at the CrossFit Games, but that wasn't their goal. They're feeding their family and they don't have time to belong to a gym, but they move every day. So if your activities are functional, you'll measure functional. And if your activities are dysfunctional, you'll measure dysfunctional. Let that be that and quit arguing it. Meaning, it doesn't mean we won't supplement with exercise, but isn't it funny how I think we've got more people that exercise that are becoming dysfunctional than people who just have to get up and haul water and chop wood. And so let's think about that in a different way. Once we measure function, if we can measure function, what is the movement dosage to improve function? Meaning, if, if I measure poor vision and I go in the back and grind you out some lenses and I put them on, at some point, we're going to go back to that eye chart to see if I am worth your investment, right? So the first time we movement screen somebody, it's on them. It tells me a lot about their lifestyle, their past injuries, and the way they currently move, their state of readiness according to movement. But the next time I movement screen them, it's on me because hopefully I injected some advice. Stop doing that, do that differently, start doing more of that. And if you can only take one piece of advice, what do you think is the most important one? Stop doing that, okay? What we learn as coaches and as therapists and as physicians and trainers and stuff like that is I can actually change you more by getting you to cease a bad behavior than sprinkling on a good behavior. And so everything we do is important, but if we can't protect you from a, a point of entry that you shouldn't be on, nothing else matters in our instruction. Remember, are these people at the ER after exercise because the exercise wasn't explained well, or they thought their point of entry was something other than it was? Now, I'm sure some of those people had a very poor coach, but the majority of them didn't have a lack of exercise information. They had a lack of personal awareness of their physical currency. <laughs> Don't cash that check. You're not bringing enough mobility. Don't cash that check. You're not bringing enough stability. Don't cash that check. You don't own that movement pattern. You see what I'm saying? So we need a clean way to talk about this. And one of the most important things I've ever done when I movement screen somebody is I don't tell them they're dysfunctional. I put them in a position where they should be able to move easily and other people can and they can't, meaning I put them right up against that thing that I already measured. But I don't need to tell them it's their QL or it's their tibial plateau. I don't need to tell them the anatomy. I simply put them in a situation where they realize for the first time how big a difference there is in their right ankle dorsiflexion and their left ankle dorsiflexion. They tell me, oh, I can't bend as much on this side. Yeah, that's exactly what your test said. And we're going to do this for a few reps and then see if that test changes. And it's that buy-in, that level of awareness and that slow down, not gonna tell you what your problem is. I'm gonna show you how to feel what your problem is so you can feel as it's improving and when it's gone. So, who needs what and how much? That's what dosage is all about. Now let me tell you about a few heroes. Florence Kendall a physical therapist who was looking at ways of grading muscle strength. Now, it's really easy if you're in healthcare or rehab to, to look at life as simply the absence of disease, disability, and dysfunction. But I think life is way more than that. When we study female ACL, we look at all the females that had an ACL injury and try to basically measure all the things that are deficient in them, like stiff ankles and weak core. But do we ever look at it in reverse and find the female athlete that played two to three sports, graduated with uh, no problems whatsoever, and outside of maybe a sprained ankle here and a bumper bruise there from a contact injury, they survived high school athletics? Did we ever measure those kids and see why they didn't get the ACL? Or are we just too busy explaining why the kids who had one retrospectively got one. We got to measure both. Florence Kendall was brilliant. She went to West Point, bunch of cadets, 
who shouldn't have anything wrong with them because they wouldn't be making it through the obstacle course, calisthenics, marches, and all the physical things we were doing. They'd be dropping off. So that group has almost been pre-screened by the activity they're in. And she did manual muscle testing, brake test, or strength test on this population. Now, what is she doing? She's setting a local range on a norm, all right? young, healthy males at the time, I, and I don't think she did it for, for females, she may have, but I'm just quoting exactly the study we're doing. She started this journey measuring normal strength in what she thought was normal males, and then she had something to work backward from. And so she's giving us a range of strength, and she's doing something like this. Up top is normal, and then we work backward, and she's got some hard things that she can talk about. Objective things, like can they move against gravity or not? Brilliant for the time, and at least it gave us a scale, because strength existed before Florence did this. But now we can communicate and be accountable for strength measures. Now. There are more reliable ways to do this now. We have dynamometers and we can do bilateral comparison and percent deficit. But just realize that going to normal and working down gave us a scale that I think was more reliable than anything we had before. James Syriax understood strength but he was going one step deep, deeper. As a orthopedic non-surgical physician, he was dealing with musculoskeletal injuries and realized that pain's a complicating factor of those. But when we do have pain, it doesn't mean we're always weak and it doesn't mean we always retain our strength. There is a distribution of pain across strong and weak. And it looks like this. Strong and painless is considered a state of normalcy. Strong and painful is abnormal, but but we don't think there's a huge integrity problem in the tension building systems, meaning your tendon, your muscle are intact, but you still have pain. We're thinking a minor lesion, inflammation, some other problem. When you're weak and painful, we're thinking this is pretty serious. It has robbed your function and caused you symptoms. But there is another way it can exist, weak and painless. And this is where Syriac said, quit thinking orthopedics and start thinking neurological. Start thinking a neurological problem here. So he's talking inhibition or something like that. So Florence Kendall gave us a range of strong to weak. James Syriax came back in and said, okay, with the clinical complication of pain, doesn't mean we forget strong and weak. We need those two because those help us define the state of progress. Now, a functional diagnostic system must know what norm is and what norm is in the presence of symptoms. And Florence Kendall and James Syriac sort of handed that to us, and many of the things we do in orthopedic assessment today go back to the roots that they created in a logical and objective way to think about strength testing. Number one, we need a range of strength so everybody can get an assignment and a category. And number two, we need a state of strength because sometimes pain's involved and we need to basically carry both things, okay? So when I came to this, I was talking health is not simply the absence of disease and fitness is not simply the absence of inactivity. Yet, when we go to healthcare, your vital signs are literally a nonverbal screen. We can ask you how you're feeling, but we're also gonna look at your vital signs. But when it comes to a healthcare practitioner, talking to you about exercise, they ask you if you're active. And if you say you're not, they're gonna tell you to exercise. And then you're gonna to go to the ER. <laughs> Meaning because they didn't tell you how to exercise, they didn't tell you what your point of entry was, they didn't tell you if you need to be exercising because they think you have a balance problem or a flexibility problem. They just know that we're a sedentary culture and we need to be more active. But look what happened to the people over the last 10 years that took that advice. It says consult a physician before before you start an exercise program, and they said, go start an exercise program. Now, they're looking at your vital signs, but not your movement vital signs. So they're looking at your heart, and they're listening to your lungs, and they're looking at your height and weight and hypertension and stuff like that, but they're not checking to see how you move, and therefore, they don't know what your point of entry is. But unfortunately, you can go on YouTube and become an expert in exercise in 17 minutes. And the Dunning-Kruger effect would demonstrate that you're going to come become brilliant about exercise in a matter of minutes simply because you have access to people in tight clothes telling you how to do it. 
But if you've been in exercise and rehab and performance enhancement as long as me, you'll realize how much you didn't know when you thought you knew it all. And as we come back around, it all starts with we're better at cardiovascular stuff because we're proactive with our screens, not just our surveys. We're proactive with eye care for the exact same reason. When it comes to activity level, we ask you if you're active, but we don't screen you for all of the things that would demonstrate that even if you are active, you're active in an inconsistent and unproductive way, or no matter what you say, I can tell by your screens and the way you move that you're not active. Your body comp tells me a lot about your activity and your diet and your movement patterns tell me the same thing. And so having conversations about exercise without setting those baselines keeps us from a point of entry. Let's expand health. It's not just the absence of disease, it's the absence of behaviors and physiological signs that precede disease, therefore we can do something about it. Fitness is the absence of behaviors and physiological signs that limit physical activity even if you were motivated to do it. So I honestly think the words health and fitness have been so misused and applied to so many different things that we have great healthcare practitioners and we got people watching the clock. We got great fitness professionals and we got people that probably won't be doing fitness next month because something else will come along. Wellness, the absence of health risk factors. Function, the absence of activity risk factors. Hold that for a minute. If that sounds too simple, just let it be because no matter what you think your health is, if you've got wellness risk factors or health risk factors, we need to know about it. So what you are now is fine, but you're basing that on the way you feel in your own perspective. You need to rub yourself up against an objective baseline and we'll find out where you distribute. Now, when we look at these wellness and fitness risk factors, look at all the ones with wellness, pain with movement, previous lost time injury, high body mass index, there's a grip strength asymmetry, and low cardiovascular fitness are all things that basically say if you start moving and you got a bunch of these things going on, it's probably not gonna go well for you. Reduce physical activity and muscle strength asymmetry are fitness risk factors. So, so there are some risk factors out there, but who's measuring this stuff before you exercise and who's doing it in an objective way so we can call it a screen? Nobody, we're all just having conversations about activity, making recommendations based on those conversations, not the measurements we're supposed to be doing. So there, right now to date, is no such thing as a well orthopedic screen because if you go to somebody with an orthopedic background, they will immediately do an assessment on you. They will investigate looking for something instead of just saying you met your movement vital signs. So when we come up with a lot of these different weird and wonky movements, it's not to see if you can do exercises that look like this. We know that by putting you in certain patterns, you'll run up against a mobility or stability problem that will cause you to get a different score on one of these things. So we threw a lot of these movements out there. We made them as low tech and low equipment involved as possible, but also as objective uh, as goniometry, joint measurements. So we, we had a twofold thing. We wanted a functional tool that was very practical, but we didn't want you to have to go buy cameras and force plates and everything just to start the functional conversation. So. Our contribution was, since Florence Kendall and James Syriax gave us a way to locally dive in on strength range in the state of strength, we wanted to do the same thing with movement. So a way that we basically look at your global range of ability is through the FMS. But if you have pain there, we need to define that state with the SFMA, which is pain sensitive movement test, as opposed to a function sensitive movement test. So if you look on under global range, we can test your movement patterns. We can go into the Y balance test and test your balance on one arm, one leg, and then compare it to the other side. And if those things are good, we can move on into capacity and look at your fundamental capacity screen and still look at that global range, seeing where you stack up. If any of those tests cause pain, we're back over at the selective function movement assessment, finding the state 
of how that pain is affecting your function and keeping you right there because that presence of pain, one of the most robust risk factors for the fact that movement endeavors aren't gonna go well for you is the first thing we must take off the table. So if your range is free of pain, we let your range tell us your entry point. If your range test causes you pain, that is now the priority and you're in healthcare having a completely different movement battery of test being pain sensitive to state. Now, here's what's happened over the past few years. We had our wellness, we had our fitness risk factors, but now we've got these global functional movement tests that actually complement and contribute to the job here. Simply taking the FMS and the YBT, we can look at balance test and movement pattern test, and even something as simple as a screen for ankle mobility, and literally say, if you flunk all these, they're way easier and quicker to check, and the cool thing is checking these things also tells you the exercise path you need to be on. Meaning, we can not only find your state of readiness, we can gauge your point of entry by using a global screen. That's how it fits. And you can then refine your own talent as a rehab or, or training partner or coach or performance enhancement person because now you're watching this sensitive gauge of, gauge of function and you will never put performance goals or weight loss goals or a single rehabilitation goal in front of these risk factors that, that people have. Now, Screens put you in the next best environment. And some people who show up to fitness need to look at wellness and function a little bit more. Some people in wellness and function need to get on with it and get over into fitness because they've already passed the test they need to. And some people who are working on performance need to take a step back and realize if they got better balance, maybe they'd hit better golf shots. So there is a great way to use these screens and surveys to put you right where you need to be and what we've realized is people are showing up at the ER with enthusiasm about exercise, not knowing where they need to be, but just knowing where they want to be and consuming an exercise because of what it looks like or its attractiveness, not by its practical value or transferability. And we've got to develop the language to help them find that. And we've got to help them find that entry point so their very first experience in exercise can be measurably productive, not with an adaptation, but with a response. And if that confuses you a little bit, you need to watch Conflicted too, because that's where I brought, brought you up to this point. I'm named after this guy. Actually, I'm named after both my grandfathers. And uh, uh, this, is, this is Earl Cook, and he showed up at uh, my graduation at Pfeiffer College in Miami. But at his feet in the truck shop, the parts dealership that he worked at, Eubank Paulette, I remember him saying this, and I just thought it was the coolest, wisest thing I ever heard. It was sort of like a Mark Twain thing, because everybody wants good, cheap, and fast all the time, forever and ever, amen, and Western culture wants it even better, cheaper, and faster than everybody else. We've been trained for that. And I used to love the way he used to say it, because everybody coming to his parts counter wanted those three things, and he'd say, pick two. And I just thought it was beautiful because in that is some wisdom of human nature. And most of us uh, expect everything to be good. And then we can decide if it needs to be cheap or fast. But the other thing you need to ask yourself is why are you in such a hurry? I've always said that if, if people in Western, Western culture could go to a website or an app and get a martial arts black belt overnight, they would. But that's not the same black belt as somebody who's got eight years invested. It looks the same. It's equally attractive when worn, but it's the way that creates the warrior, not the uniform. And, and so this is, this is sort of just one of those slow down and think about what you're asking for. So when we see the good, cheap, and fast analogy, we realize that that center point we're trying to punch is rarely possible. And we've literally got to work through a conflict of, listen, if it took you a long time to put this weight on, it's probably going to be better for you all the way around if it takes a little while to get it off because it demonstrates lifestyle change, not just how fast you can dehydrate hydrate yourself and vice versa. And by the way, all these people showing up at the ER, you think they were seeking fast and cheap solutions to their active life or do you think they were looking for good? Because if they were looking for good, they wouldn't be in the ER, they'd still be at the gym. But I think they were looking for cheap or fast and they didn't know their point of entry. Now, 
What I promised you guys is I want to take you guys into a practical exercise session, not where I'm talking about the exercise. I'm actually coaching a problem in the room the way they have that problem. And I'm going to only use one piece of equipment. It's the, the foam roll sliced in half. Okay, So um, I've got a half round roll and I'm going to take that one thing in a, in a live exercise session and use that obstacle not to tell three different people, three different body types how to move. I'm going to use it to do exactly what a speed bump does. Slow down and pay attention. Now, you can look at the sign or you can hit the speed bump. Which one's more effective? See, I honestly think that we've been coaching for so long, we simply have all these signposts with exercise. But people don't read signs. Sometimes people need to be thumped in the head and some people, sometimes people need to spill their coffee because they're going too fast. So what I'm going to use is not a bunch of words and terms to coach somebody. I'm going to impose a speed bump on stability, mobility, and symmetry and let you watch how I put people down a path to become self-aware. I'm going to basically take a mobility uh, path, a stability or motor control path, and a symmetry path and show you how I can put people with simply one or two tests right in a path that gives us a measurable. And we know that most people are coming to exercise with risk factors. We just don't know which risk factors. And if you're going to do some tests pre-exercise, they need to be as many screens as surveys and then you'll know exactly what path to put them on as well as where their entry point is. Now, partner of mine, Phil Plisky, um, uh, got on the internet and, and presented uh, a year's worth of research done with the U.S. military looking at people getting injured doing their job in the military, whether, whether it be you know, a, a highly active job or a fairly sedentary job. They get injured, they go through rehab, they come out of rehab. He's going to tell you some startling things about what happens coming out of rehab because I think what's happening is we're solving the pain or the boo-boo that you come to us for, but we're not using that opportunity to see how many other risk factors you have. And if you walk out of my clinic thinking you're well and you have seven risk factors and I didn't tell you, this on me because I'm the physical environment that you're supposed to make it out of and I'm supposed to be able not only to give you a diagnosis, this is what I think happened to you, but as you're leaving me, I'm supposed to give you a thing called a prognosis and this is how how I think it's going to go. And if I tell you you got risk factors and it's not going to go well unless you take a scaled approach to your exercise and you don't take my advice, I'm okay with that. But if I don't say it, I'm not okay with that. So you can still take the advice or not, but I think if I make a good case and if I solve your diagnostic problem, maybe you can listen to me about my prognosis. Guys, I really try to talk cleanly and plainly about movement in a way that you guys can reproduce everything I say. We've got a common sense approach course on evaluating movement and a common sense approach on correcting movement. And if you want to see the real time corrections in progress, go to the go to the article I shared with you where I'm coaching up three different people and listen to what I'm doing. It's really easy to look at those three programs and think they're interchangeable. Oh, I want to add this. Don't look who I'm adding, which program program to and what we measure when they come out of that. I wanted to mention one other person because when I talk about Florence Kendall and James Syriax, I also like to talk about Vladimir Yanda. Um, uh, my early influence, he kept me um, connected to the neurological model and one of the statements that I think that he is attributed to him and, and many others in, in, in his educational uh, uh, lineage, uh, time spent in assessment will save time in treatment. Time spent in screening will tell you who you need to assess. And always remember this, guys, when you're looking for a real movement professional, sometimes you just got to watch the little ones move around. And uh, if you can apply one thing to the coaching session that I hope you guys will get a chance to say, it's uh, watch me shut up and coach. I think we all need to do that. I need to do that. And coaching is about creating an obstacle and letting them work through it without giving them the answer. And they will own the answer in feel and in presence and awareness. And that's, that's where we got to be teaching right now. So take, take the hands-on session. Do it to yourself. Do it to somebody else. And I promised you a lab after all these lectures. Go do it. Thank you.